When Abraham sent his servant on a long journey, his servant took ten camels to carry everything he needed. Eliezer woke with a start. The sky was still black, but it was time to go. He had an important job to do. Abraham appeared out of the darkness. He smiled at his old and faithful servant. The Lord will send his angel ahead of you, my friend, he said. God will see to it that you find just the woman he has picked for Isaac's bride. She will be a woman from my homeland. We cannot let Isaac marry one of the heathen women who live here. He should marry someone who believes in God. Eliezer thought about his mission as he traveled day after dusty day. Abraham was so sure that the Lord's angel would be traveling ahead of him. He would meet many strangers. Just how would he find the right woman? Which would be the woman the Lord had picked? Finally, Eleazar arrived at the city of Nahor, where Abram's relatives lived. It was almost evening. He was tired of traveling and he was thirsty. So were the camels. Suddenly, Eleazar had an idea. He raised his head toward heaven and prayed. Lord God of my master Abraham, give me success today. Keep your promise to my master. I am here at the village well. The young women of the city will soon be coming for water. I will say to one, Please lower your jar and let me have a drink. If she says drink, and I will also bring water for your camels, May she be the one you have chosen for your servant, Isaac. Before Eleazar had finished praying, a beautiful young girl appeared. She came to the well and filled her water jar. Could this be the one? Eleazar wondered. He ran to meet her. Please, give me a drink of water from your jar, he asked. The girl, Rebecca, quickly lowered the jar from her shoulder. She offered it to Eleazar, and he drank his fill. Then she said the very words Eleazar had prayed for. I will also bring water for your camels. Rebecca emptied her jar into the animal's drinking trough. Then she hurried to the well for more water. Eleazar smiled joyfully. God had answered his prayer so quickly. And the girl was so friendly and so kind. When Rebecca returned, Eleazar said to her, Please, tell me who your father is. And when she told him, Eleazar knelt down and worshipped God. Praise the Lord, the God of my master Abraham. He has faithfully kept his promise to my master. The Lord has led me straight to my master's relatives. Rebecca went home and told her brother Laban about this servant of Abraham. Laban immediately went to the well and invited Eleazar to their home. Eleazar told them about his mission from Abraham. He told them about his prayer and how God had answered it so quickly. Would Rebekah agree to Abraham's request? Rebekah had listened carefully. She heard how God had led Eleazar to her family. She believed God was leading in this, so she agreed to go with Eleazar. She would leave her family and her homeland. She would become Isaac's wife. Isaac and Rebecca had been happily married for years. Rebecca loved to remember the day she had met the stranger at the well. She had offered to water his camels and her life had changed forever. Isaac praised the Lord for bringing her to him from so far away. Yes, Isaac and Rebekah loved each other very much. But something was missing in their lives. Rebekah was not able to have children, and it made her very sad. Isaac knew about God's promise to Abraham, his father. God had told Abraham that his family would become a mighty nation. Isaac spent a great deal of time wondering how that could be. How could a mighty nation come from Abraham's family? Isaac didn't have any children. It was a sad puzzle, one that Isaac longed to solve. 
Finally, Isaac pleaded with God. He begged God to give Rebekah a child. And God answered Isaac's prayer in a surprising way. Rebekah had not one child, but two. God gave Isaac and Rebekah twin boys. Even before the twins were born, they struggled together inside their mother. Rebekah thought this was strange. No one could explain why this was happening. Her husband couldn't. Her nurse couldn't. Neither could anyone else, she asked. So Rebekah talked to God. She prayed and asked God what was happening. God answered Rebekah's prayer. He told her that the two children inside of her were very different. They would be the beginnings of two different nations, two nations that wouldn't like each other very much. One twin would be stronger than his brother, and the elder would serve the younger. Isaac and Rebekah named their twins Esau and Jacob, and just as the Lord had said, the boys were very different. Esau, the older, liked to travel away from home. When he wanted something, he wanted it right now. He liked to hunt and often brought his father things from afar, and he was his father's favorite twin. Jacob, on the other hand, liked to stay close to home. He learned how to take care of his father's flocks and herds. He learned to cook. He spent a lot of time with his mother. And, of course, Jacob was his mother's favorite twin. One day Esau came in from hunting, and he was very hungry, and he smelled something good. Jacob was cooking something good. It might have been lentil stew. Esau stood before his brother and exclaimed, I'm starving. Then he demanded, Let me have some of that. Jacob replied, Are you really so hungry? Hungry enough to trade me your rights as the firstborn son? Esau answered, I'm about to die of hunger. What good will my rights do me then? So Jacob gave him some bread and some of the food. Esau ate and drank and then got up and left. He did not care about his rights as the firstborn son. All he cared about was how he felt at the moment. And because of that, he gave up something that would have been a blessing for the rest of his life when he had to leave home. Then God shared a special time with him. After that, Jacob never felt lonely. Isaac and Rebekah's twins, Esau and Jacob, had never liked each other very much. But now the situation was much worse. Jacob had tricked their father into giving him a special blessing. It was a blessing that Esau should have received. Esau was so angry at Jacob that he wanted to kill him. So their mother, Rebekah, decided to send Jacob to his uncle Laban. Stay with your uncle for a while, Jacob. Give your brother time to cool his anger, she said sadly. Little did she know that she would never see Jacob again. So Jacob started out on the long trip to Laban's home, his mother's brother. His uncle Laban lived a long way from Jacob's parents. It was almost 500 miles through strange and dangerous country. Jacob was all alone and he was frightened. He had no one to protect him from wild beasts or robbers. And he wasn't used to sleeping on the hard ground. He traveled as fast as he could. He knew he was running for his life. He knew his brother wanted to kill him. In a day or two, Jacob arrived at a special place. His grandfather, Abraham, had once built an altar there to worship God. Jacob was so tired that night, he may not have even known he was in such a special place. He just wrapped up in his blanket and went to sleep with his head on a rock. That night, Jacob had an unusual dream. Not an ordinary dream at all, but a special dream from God. In his dream, Jacob saw a huge ladder or staircase 
it reached all the way from the earth to heaven. Jacob saw angels going up and down the ladder. God spoke to him, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham and Isaac. I will be with you and protect you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you. Jacob sat up and looked around. The Lord is here, he exclaimed. He is in this place, and I didn't know it. Jacob got up early the next morning. The stars were just beginning to fade away, and the sun was just beginning to light the eastern sky. Jacob wanted to do something to mark this special place. The Lord himself had spoken to him there. So he used the stone he had used for a pillow and set it upright in the ground. He poured oil all over it and dedicated it to God. And then he named this special place Bethel, the house of God. So Jacob continued on his journey. He was no longer afraid of his brother. He was not afraid of wild beasts or robbers. He knew for sure that the Lord was with him. The Lord was protecting him. God had told him so. Jacob neared the city of Haran. He hoped to find his mother's family there. His journey was almost over and he was so glad. On the outskirts of Haran, Jacob saw a well. It was about noon and three flocks of sheep were gathered there. Why are these flocks at the well in the middle of the day? He wondered. This well was different from those near Jacob's home. He saw that a huge stone covered the well's opening. There were no troughs from which the sheep could drink. Jacob approached the well and spoke to the shepherds gathered there. My brothers, where are you from? He asked. We are from Haran, one shepherd replied. Do you know a man named Laban who lives there? Jacob questioned. Yes, we know him, the shepherds answered. Then Jacob asked, Is he well? Yes, he is, replied one of the shepherds. In fact, here comes his daughter Rachel with some of his sheep. She is a shepherdess. The man pointed to a young woman coming toward them. Jacob looked and saw Rachel coming to the well. She was leading a flock of sheep, but she was still quite some distance away. Jacob continued talking with the shepherds. Tell me, why don't you water your sheep and take them back to the pasture? He asked. There is still a lot of daylight left. We can't, they replied. It is our custom to wait until all the flocks are gathered. When they are all here, we remove the big stone from the well. Then all the animals drink, and we cover the well again. While Jacob and the shepherds talked together, Rachel and her sheep arrived. Jacob went over to the well. He kindly rolled the heavy stone away from the opening. Then he led his uncle Laban's sheep to the water and cared for them. He spoke kindly to Rachel. I am Jacob, and I am one of your relatives. I have come a long way to meet your family. Your father's sister, Rebecca, is my mother. He was so glad to finally meet a relative that he began to cry. His long journey was over. He was with family again. Please, wait right here, Rachel exclaimed. I want to let my father know that you are here. Then she turned quickly and ran toward home. An excited Rachel told her father about Jacob. Laban was amazed that Jacob had come so far. He hurried back to the well with her. How wonderful to meet you, Jacob, he exclaimed. He hugged his nephew and kissed his cheeks as that was their custom. We're so glad you're here. Come, let's go home so we can visit. Laban led the way. Soon they reached Laban's home. 
There Jacob told his uncle about the family he had left behind. He talked about his mother, Rebecca, and how she had sent Jacob to Laban. And Uncle Laban welcomed his nephew Jacob into his home. Soon Jacob became a part of Laban's family. Yes, Jacob helped Rachel by removing the heavy stone from the well, and he helped her by watering the sheep. No. Hi everyone, it's Aunt Fernita. Today's story is called "Who Cheated." The memory verse is from First Corinthians chapter thirteen, verse four. It says, "Love is patient. Love is kind." Today's message is God helps us serve others faithfully and patiently. Have you ever worked hard and long for someone you love? Maybe it was helping your dad stack wood or repair the house, or maybe you helped your mom in the garden all day. You were glad when it was over, but because you loved that person, it was worth it. Jacob had been at Laban's house for a month. One day, Laban said, "Jacob, you are my relative." It doesn't seem right for you to keep working for me without pay. Tell me, what wages would you like? Jacob was glad to be at his uncle's house. He didn't mind the work, and he also had been admiring Uncle Laban's youngest daughter, Rachel. Uncle Laban, what I would really like is to marry Rachel. I will work seven years for you. If you will let Rachel become my wife, Laban agreed. That sounds like a fine arrangement to me. Yes, stay here and work for me. In those days, a man gave money to the father of the woman he wanted to marry. After the wedding, the father was to give the money to his daughter. It became her own to keep. Some men didn't have money for the bride price or dowry, as it was called. So, if the father agreed, the man could work for him for a certain amount of time, and that's what Jacob had to do. So Jacob began seven years of work to make Rachel his wife. Day after day, he faithfully and patiently did all that Laban asked. And the time seemed to pass quickly because of his love for Rachel. Finally, the seven years were up. It was time to make Rachel his bride. But Laban was not honest or fair with Jacob. He liked having Jacob work without pay. He knew that Jacob worked hard without complaining. It was clear that God was helping Jacob to become a faithful worker, and he didn't cost Laban anything. So Laban decided to do something very wrong. He would trick Jacob to get more free labor from him. In those days, the bride wore a heavy veil during the wedding celebration. No one was to see her face. That night, Jacob took his veiled bride to his tent. He couldn't see that it was Leah, not Rachel. In the morning, Jacob made a terrible discovery. He had married the wrong sister. He was shocked and angry. How could his uncle have done such a thing? Uncle Laban, why have you done this? Jacob asked. I worked hard for you so I could marry Rachel. Why did you trick me? It is our custom, Laban lied, for the older sister to marry before the younger. But I'll make a bargain with you. You may also marry Rachel if you work for me for another seven years. In those days, in that country, many men had more than one wife. 
So at the end of the week of Leah's wedding celebration, Jacob and Rachel were also married. Then Jacob began to work seven more years for Laban. Jacob worked without pay for 14 years, a long time, to marry Rachel. Patiently, he served Laban all that time. He truly believed that having Rachel for his wife was worth it, and God helped him to serve faithfully even when the work was hard. The years had gone by since Jacob had left his home and family. Twenty years he had worked for his uncle Laban. By this time, Jacob had ten sons and at least one daughter. After Joseph had been born, Jacob had asked Laban to let him return to Canaan. But Laban had begged him to stay. Please stay, Laban had pleaded. I know that the Lord has blessed me because of you. So Jacob had agreed to stay, and Laban had agreed to pay Jacob for his work. All the spotted, speckled, and dark-colored sheep or goats would belong to Jacob. Since that time, many animals had been added to Jacob's flock. Jacob was now a wealthy man. Laban's sons were not happy about this. Jacob knew that they believed his flocks should belong to them. And Jacob also knew that Laban's attitude towards him was not what it had been. So when the Lord told Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers, Jacob knew it was time to leave. Without a word to Laban, he gathered his wives, his children, and his flocks and started for Canaan. After three days, Laban learned that Jacob was gone. Laban started after him. Seven days later, Laban caught up with Jacob. That night, God spoke to Laban. The next day, Jacob watched Laban and his men. He wrinkled his forehead with concern as they drew nearer. He knew that Laban would not be happy with him. Why did you run away without telling me? shouted Laban. You didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye. You know it is in my power to harm you. But last night God told me not to say anything to you, good or bad. Jacob answered, I left without telling you because I thought you might try to take my wives and children away. Uncle Laban, Jacob continued, I have been a faithful worker for you for twenty years. During that time, I was careful to take good care of your animals. I didn't complain about my work, whether it was blistering hot or freezing cold. I worked fourteen years to pay my debt to you for your daughters. And these past six years, I have worked to earn my animals. During that time, you changed my pay ten times. But God was with me. You would have sent me away empty-handed, but God knows how hard I've worked for you, and that is why he talked to you last night. Jacob, in a way, everything you have is from me, Laban spoke sharply. These are my daughters and my grandchildren. The animals you have came from my flocks, but it wouldn't be right for me to keep my daughters and their children. Laban's voice was kinder now. Let's make a peaceful agreement, he offered. Jacob agreed. So both families gathered some stones into a big heap. These stones are a witness between us, said Laban. I will not go past this pile of stones to harm you, and you will not pass it to harm me. Jacob repeated the promise. I will not harm you, and you will not harm me. Then the two men and their families shared a meal together. 
Early the next morning, Laban kissed his daughters and grandchildren. Then Laban returned home, and Jacob and his family traveled on toward Canaan. For many years, people called that place Mizpah, a place of blessing, for it was there that Laban said to Jacob, "May the Lord keep watch between you and me when we are away from each other." In the story today, Jacob shared with Esau. Jacob was returning to his homeland. God had told him to, but he was a little nervous. Jacob remembered how he had tricked Esau into selling him his birthright. He remembered how he had tricked their father into giving him the special blessing that should have been Esau's. Would Esau still be angry with him? Jacob turned to God for help, and God sent angels to be with him. Jacob sent messengers to greet Esau. This is what you are to say to my master Esau. He directed, "Your servant Jacob says," and then he told them the rest of the message. He also told them that they were to call Esau, "My lord Esau." This would tell Esau that Jacob did not claim any inheritance, but the messengers returned with frightening news: Esau was approaching with four hundred men. Would Esau attack? Jacob wondered. Again, Jacob turned to God. Then Jacob sent Esau a message and many animals as gifts. He directed his messenger to say. Your servant Jacob is coming behind us. That night, Jacob sent his family and all his possessions across a stream called Jabbok, but he stayed behind by himself, and there he met God. All night he wrestled with an angel, then he begged for a blessing and received it. The next day, Jacob saw Esau and his four hundred men coming. Quickly, Jacob divided his family. He put the children with their mothers. Then he went to the front of the group. While still a long way from Esau, Jacob bowed low to the ground. Then he walked on and bowed again. Jacob did this seven times until they were very close. But when Esau saw Jacob, he ran to him. He threw his arms around him, and they both began to cry. Jacob must have felt such relief. After a little while, Esau asked, "Who are all these people with you?" "This is the family God has given me," Jacob told him. After the introductions, Esau asked, "What about all that you sent before you? What does that mean?" Jacob replied. These are my presents to you, my brother. I want you to know that I need your mercy and forgiveness. I already have plenty, Jacob. Keep what is yours," Esau responded graciously. But Jacob said, "No, please accept these gifts. It will show me that you have truly forgiven me. God has been good to me, and I have all I need." Esau finally accepted the gifts. Then he said, "Let us be on our way. I'll travel with you." "Thank you, Esau," Jacob replied gratefully. "But we really need to travel much slower than you do. We have so many children and young animals." "Then let me leave some of my men with you," Esau responded. "No, thank you," said Jacob. "I only want to please you, my master." Esau left then and went on ahead. Jacob, with his large family and flocks, followed slowly. Finally, they reached Shechem in the land of Canaan, Jacob's homeland. There, Jacob purchased land. After twenty years, he would finally have a home, a place for his family and his flocks. Even though he was anxious to reach Canaan. Jacob put his family's needs first. 
When we truly serve others, we will be considerate of their needs too.